God gave me There's only we got a son That's how I survived in these dirty rotten slum These dirty rotten slum These dirty rotten slum God gave me There's only we got a son Praise be Jesus Christ Now and forever How you doing my brothers and sisters in Christ? Welcome to Sunday Readings with Charlie the Catholic You know this is a show where we dive into the scripture readings for a Sunday which today is the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And today I'm joined by a special guest, someone who I'm sure a lot of you heard of, the protest priest himself. I'd like to welcome Father Stephen Imperato to Sunday Readers with Charlie the Catholic. Father Steve, thank you for coming. I'm so happy you're here. Well, it's good to be with you, Charlie, and all your listeners and viewers. It's a privilege on my part. Father Steve, I don't know if you know this, but before the pandemic hit, I was looking forward eagerly to a parish mission that you were going to do in, in Lynnhurst, New Jersey, at St. Michael's, you know? And it was something I was, I was waiting for. I marked it on my calendar, but the pandemic hit, and slowly but surely, everything started closing and closing. And unfortunately, that parish mission never came to fruition, you know? But I'm happy that you're here today. So maybe, you know, my viewers could get a taste of that type of parish mission you was going to offer, you know? Yeah. And of course, Father Stanley, the pastor of that parish, who was my spiritual director for over 40 years, has since passed away. Yeah, God bless I'm the exec- his soul. I'm the executor, the executor of his state, uh, state. And of course, yes, I was in New Jersey. Now, I, 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 I didn't know that, Charlie. I recognize your Jersey twang. <laughs> uh, very similar to my Jersey twang. Uh, I didn't know that I had done past missions at uh, St. Michael's. Have have we met before? Oh, man, I missed out. I missed out. I thought this was going to be your debut. I did not know. I was, oh. you know, I was really, I was happy it was going to be so close to home. I, you know, it, it never happened, unfortunately. Right, right. Well, we're going to give him heaven today. Yeah. So, Father Stephen Imperato, let my viewers know. Who is Father Steve and how did you become Catholic? Well, I'm actually a cradle Catholic. So my story is not one of conversion. It's one of reversion. Uh, I was uh, born in 1952. So the first years of my life, and I can remember, we lived right across the street from the Catholic Church. My grandfather bringing me in the stroller to the TLM every single day. Oh, and all awesome. through gra- all through grammar school, I went to mass every single day, went to Catholic school, went to mass. We didn't have to go to mass. We could have went to uh, straight to class, but I went to mass. I was a server for five years in the traditional Latin mass. And then uh, I actually remember the tradition, the uh, transitional mass that was half vernacular, half Latin. And then when I went to Burton Catholic High School, my 50th reunion is actually coming up uh, for Burton Catholic at the end of this month, actually the beginning of October. I actually lost my faith uh, because of all the heresies and the nonsense, the, the garbage that was being taught after Vatican II. Not that Vatican II was heretical, but uh, the heretics in the church use that as a, an opportunity to preach heresy. And I stopped going to mass, fell away from the sacraments for 15 years. Wow. Was guilty of an was guilty of an abortion during that period of time that I found out decades later, took the lives of two children. Uh, and then I had my reversion right around the time I was 30. I tell everybody that uh, my my quote unquote, midlife crisis came when I was 30, but I had a reversion and uh, started going back to mass every day. And that reversion led me to adopting a little boy from Columbia who unfortunately has since taken his own life in 2014. But I'm a great grandpa, Charlie. Uh, He left me with four beautiful grandchildren and now my oldest granddaughter still up in Jersey. They're up in Sussex County. I'll be seeing them, uh, Uh, the end of this month or the beginning of October. Uh, I have three beautiful great-grandchildren. So I'm a great-grandpa priest. I know everybody's saying, Father, you look too young to be a great-grandpa. That's what I tell my uh, granddaughter all the time, who has the three great-grandchildren. And so actually adopting John led me to pro-life activism. Pro-life activism led me to the seminary. And uh, I've been ordained a priest now 16 years. Oh, and I am God. now, 
and I'm now retired. I'm a retired priest. I just actually moved from Albuquerque. I was with the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, and uh, I just moved to Florida, and I plan on continuing my pro-life ministry down here. I have a camper trailer, trailer, uh, pull-along trailer. That's a Mother yeah, Teresa. Yeah, it. It's very nice. It's very nice. Yeah. Yeah, tell my trailer. viewers, uh, you know, your, your, your website and where they could help and maybe donate to help the cause. Sure. LifeMinistriesUS.org. LifeMinistriesUS.org. And people who are on social media can follow me either on my YouTube channel or Facebook. I do a Facebook Live every single morning. I live stream my mass every morning from my St. Padre Pio Chapel here. But my main minute, my my main website is lifeministriesus.org. That will take the people to protest child killing on the road for life, the, the different, I guess, uh, tentacles of my uh, ministry. But for the most part, I'm doing uh, pro-life work now and then also social media ministry. You know, and God bless your son. May he rest in peace. I remember Amen. hearing you in a homily on EWTN tell that story. Right. You know, and and it, it's unique. You know, it's a unique story for a priest. You know, a lot of people think, you know, they're all celibate and have no kids. You know, right. you, you were blessed not only with a son, but great, with kid, grandkids and great right. grandkids. So praise God for your story, you know. I thank you for that. Well, thank be Jesus Christ, right? Uh, praise be Jesus Christ as we mm -hmm. opened up the show now and forever. Uh, yeah, I've had an interesting life. Uh, there's there's no doubt about it. Uh, many people are saying, Father, you should write a book. And I said, no way I'll write a book while I'm alive. I have somebody who's uh, willing to write a book for me. I told him you can publish it after I die because the last thing I want to be is a celebrity priest. Right, right. And, and your work which we're going to hear in today's second reading, you know, works are necessary because works, faith without works is dead. You know, and right. the work you did is very heroic, you know, and I just want to say on behalf of the faithful, thank you for saying yes to your vocation and also thank you saying yes, you know, to following it to your ministries and what you've done for the unborn. You know, I follow you. You was with a priest for life, you know, at one point. And, you know, now you're out there, you you, you got you roll up your sleeves and, and you're out there getting the what, what Pope Francis says, the smell of the flock on you because you're out there actually doing stuff. I just know you've got arrested for, for protesting at uh, abortion clinics. Am I right? Yeah, I've been arrested five times for going into these abortion facilities trying to save women at the last moment. Uh, in the waiting rooms, in the hallways, outside the waiting rooms, when they're coming off the uh, off the elevator, I've been arrested five times. Thank God, other than the single days of processing, I've only spent uh, six days in jail. Uh, and actually, I was uh, four of my five arrests were in Washington D.C. because I was trying to bring the person of presidential executive order uh, to President Trump's attention. Uh, trying to leverage him to sign it. And of course, I was convinced he was going to sign it if he got reelected. But of course, uh, that didn't pan out. But right. I, hey, you, I, you would think that your chances of getting something like this signed would be greater with a Catholic president. You would think, right? The irony <laughs> of this, the irony is just, and and we're, it's so obvious to the faithful for, for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear we know that there's something amiss here, but why is it so hard for, you know, those in, in you know, high ranking Catholics, like in the hierarchy to come out and, and say that, you know, hey, you're a Catholic president. Why don't you help the unborn? You know, why does it got to be so confusing? You know, well, the litany of ways that Joe Biden defies his faith is probably as long as the litany of humility. Uh, and yes, I posted, <laughs> on my I, I posted on my Facebook page this morning a couple of things that, you know, what line does Biden have to cross for the bishops to come out and actually do something? I mean, where's that line? I talk about that all the time. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. And of course, I always say that everything that Biden does or doesn't do is at the feet of the bishops because 
you know, Charlie, your your dad, right? Your Absolutely. Dad, I have seven uh, kids, seven beautiful right. kids. Okay. So your dad, well, you know, if one of your kids is sneaking out of the house every night and getting in trouble, and you never punish him for sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night and getting in trouble, your kid's going to keep sneaking out of the house every night and getting in trouble. I mean, and so not who, only that, it's going to send a message to the siblings that that's the way to well, go. Well, and, and, and exactly right. Or if this, it, it, hey, exactly, if he can do exactly it, right. why can't I? It, exactly right. So at some point in time, and I was in management for years, if the employees are getting away with murder and I'm not doing anything about it, at some point in time, it's no longer the employee's fault. It's my fault, right? And And so the bishops have to understand that uh, the reason why Biden is now coming after the Catholic Church, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion with his Absolutely. mandates is because uh, the, the bishops have allowed him to do that. The leniency. He, where is the one? Well, that's what I, you know, I, I really try not to make this show where I could air out the dirty laundry because, you know, my hope is to try to evangelize and bring people into the church. But sometimes things like this that are so public and out in, in the open, I think it's prudent of me to ask the question, like, why ain't the bishop saying something? You might hear a few of them say here and there, but I hate to say I it, think but I would love to hear the Holy Father say something, you know? Well, yeah. And I they, they do conscience easing. That's what I call it. They do just enough or say just enough to say, I'm doing something or I've said something. But really, there's no unity. I, uh, uh, I, I co-host a radio show, The Simple Truth, every Friday with Jim Avins. And we were just talking about this the last show and Friday. And uh, we, we, there's, there's, there's nothing about unity in the USCCB. Now, our Catholic faith is about unity, unity mm -hmm. in the Trinity, our faith, baptism, Right? It's all about unity, right? But there's no unity within the USCCB. Individual bishops come out and uh, stand up to Biden, like Court Alone and Strickland. Other bishops God uh, just, just cave and let him do anything that he wants and actually confront. They, they don't confront each other, these bishops. But never, ever, ever does the USCCB come out as a unified voice and say, look it. You know, Joe, we're concerned about your soul. We're concerned about your salvation. You are not in communion with the church. You have to stop doing what you're doing because we're really concerned uh, that you are uh, not going to achieve your eternal salvation. Right. And how hey. difficult it is that? You're right. I mean, how, how difficult it's, it's, it's either about money. It's about cowardice. It's about heresy, maybe. Uh, I think that there's definitely heretics within the uh, USCCB, uh, clear, blatant heretics. Uh, so it could be any number of reasons. And of course, being a pro-life activist, I will tell you, we have the same types of problems in the pro-life movement. Too much money, too much comfort, too much celebrity. And we're not doing what we need to do to decisively end pre-born child killing. The bishops aren't doing it. And the leadership of the corporate pro-life movement is not doing it either. Absolutely. You know, we're called, we're all called to holiness and we're all called to defend, especially the unborn who are the most vulnerable. They're in a place where they should be protected at the most vulnerable stage in the mother's womb. And right. it's, just, it's mind blowing that someone who could present themselves for Holy Communion, but at the same time could support the tearing of a human being limb to limb. I mean, I don't want to get too graphic or anything, but sometimes, you know, they want to censor the reality of abortion because if people knew, if America knew what abortion was, they would have stopped it yesterday, you know? But yeah, I believe that to be true. And I also believe, though, that none of us, so we believe that abortion is murder. So we're talking about mass murder. We're talking about government sanctioned. They allow it government protected by the courts and law enforcement, government funded with our tax dollars. But none of us really act as if it's murder. If we really believed it was murder and they were killing innocent babies, wouldn't we all be risking arrest through peaceful civil disobedience? Wouldn't we all be risking jail time? And I think that's the message that the Red Rose Rescue Movement, one of the messages that they're sending, the humanity of the baby, that these babies are dying alone, 
these babies are precious. We need to try and save the babies, but that each and every single one of us can do more. We got to get out of our comfort zone. I always say, Peter, Peter gets uh, uh, criticized, right, for uh, uh, losing his faith while he's walking on the water in the storm, and Jesus has to save him. But at least Peter got out of the boat. The yeah. rest of them were still in the boat. We yeah. all got to get out of the boat, even though it's stormy, and not worry about it because Jesus will save us if we uh, run into trouble. And that's the message of that particular scripture passage. That's that, right. How about we get to the reading? <laughs> you, sorry, I'm, you I'm read excited. my mind, Father Steve. You I'm, are, I'm ex, I'm ex, I'm you're a natural at this, huh? <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a preacher, first and foremost. I'm a preacher. So uh, I've looked at the readings, and they're great readings. I mean, classic Catholic readings today, right? Amen, Amen to that. So that's beautiful, and that's a great place to transition to today's readings for the 24th Sunday of Ordinary Time. So everyone, please put a tentative ear. Let's see. Maybe there's a message that God wants you to hear, you know? Every time you hear the word of God, it's a dialogue with you and God, and this is God speaking to you. So without further ado, today's first reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, a reading from the book of Isaiah. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be God. Today's response to your song comes from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. O oh Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. All right, moving to today's second reading. Again, St. James. I know I've been harping on this same string every time we're about to go into St. James, but it's <laughs> something that a lot of my fellow believers in Christ need to know about the historic truth about St. James, that the founder of Protestantism did not like the book of St. James. He wanted to remove it, along with Hebrews, along with others. And the seven books from the Old Testament were removed, you know. And again, I'm sorry for derailing, but let's see. Maybe today's reading, you'll see why Martin Luther wanted to remove this book. A reading from the letter of St. James. What does it profit, my brethren? If a man says he has faith, but has not works, can his faith save him? If a brother or sister is ill-clad and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I, by my works, will show you my faith. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now, today's gospel reading comes from St. Mark. Now, we're familiar as Catholics of St. Matthew's point of view of, of this story. This is where St. Peter says, you are the Christ. What Jesus asks is them, who do you say I am? And but without further ado, Let's get into the gospel reading. A reading from the gospel according to St. Mark, 
Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I am? John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. But who do you say that I am? You are the Christ. Jesus charged them to tell no one about him, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this plainly. Peter took him and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. Jesus called to him the multitude with his disciples. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. So, Father Steve, Isaiah, the prophet, I love when he writes about the suffering servant. A lot of people don't know that that's our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the suffering servant. I want to encourage everybody to, uh, uh, you know, Isaiah is the is the victim servant, right? Uh, the victim soul, the victim prophet. Uh, go back when you have a chance, everybody, and read the first reading as if it's Jesus speaking about his father in heaven, because that's really what the first reading is about, all right? It's Jesus speaking to his father in heaven, right? So the Lord God is our father in heaven. He opens my ear that I may hear. I have not rebelled. I've not turned back. He is my help. I am not disgraced. All right. So that's, I think, a great reflection for everybody. So I would just encourage everybody to read the first reading because it's classic from the standpoint that it's Jesus talking to his father. We know Jesus went off and prayed often to his father. Uh, and of course, we know that Jesus uh, spoke words like this. Uh, the Psalms, uh, you know, why have you forsaken me, my Lord, my Lord, why have you saved me? This is a classic example of Jesus actually talking to his father and uh, uh, praying about his father, saying that, you know, uh, with my father, uh, he's near me, nobody can oppose me, uh, uh, nobody can dispute me. I mean, it's just a beautiful, beautiful dissertation. Of course, the Psalms, and uh, the Old Testament uh, point to Jesus and are fulfilled by Jesus. But the Psalms particularly are, uh, and I, I, I heard this from a scripture scholar when I was in seminary, and I thought it was beautiful, that the Psalms were given by the Holy Spirit to the Psalm writers, written down so that Jesus would have appropriate prayers to pray to his father while he was on earth. I mean, how wow. neat that is. Wow, and, that, and, I, that's, that's mind-blowing. I've never heard right, that. Right. That's very, very interesting. That's right. So, uh, so the same thing can be said for many of the chapters of Isaiah, and I think it's really, really beautiful. Right. And, you know, uh, Jesus, the suffering servant, you know, I hear a lot of people get misunderstood and thinking, well, you know, they think, prosperity forever and there's never going to be <laughs> suffering that you know that you know what jesus suffered for me he did all the work for me he is finished they, they misunderstand it is finished it, but jesus didn't come to not he yeah he suffered for you but he also came to show you how to suffer you know he tells you to take up your cross and follow him you know and that that, that requires work you know it's not just faith yeah jesus showed us what to do he gave us an example you know, and like That's in right. today's second reading, I'm pretty sure St. James made that abundantly clear. I think he was responding to people who might have uh, misunderstood St. Paul's readings, you know, thinking that it was just faith alone. What, 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 I, you want to share any thoughts on the second readings, Father? 
Well, yes, I do, because exactly right, Charlie, you're exactly right. And of course, it is a conundrum for our Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic, who believe that they're saved by faith alone, right? The assurance of salvation. Uh, And St. James gives us some insight into actually how we're saved. And if you actually read all of St. Paul, he says the same thing. So I'm going to use St. Paul. They're not in conflict. A lot of people don't know that. St. Paul. St. Paul says there's three things that endure, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. All right, so when James is talking about works here, he's talking about love. So let me explain to everybody very simply what the Catholic theology of salvation is. We are saved by faith, all right? We're saved by faith. But our faith is manifested through our humble, loving obedience. Now, let me ask everybody. Think about loving, humble obedience. Is it work to be humble and lovingly obedient? Yes, there's no harder work than being the humble, loving, obedient servant. So our faith is manifested through loving, humble, obedience work, right? And in persevering in that loving, humble obedience we thereby have the assured hope of eternal salvation. Thereby, we Catholics believe that faith, hope, and love are work together for our salvation. And the greatest of these is love. Love. <laughs> love. The loving, That's humble right. obedience. The works that James is talking about here. That's right. That's right. And, you know, faith without works is dead, you know. Faith and, without and, and, love is dead. And, and you know, without love is dead. St. James also says, I like his whole, the whole letter is good, but he says, you have faith, you know, and he says, uh, good, the devil, the demons have faith, you right. know, but, uh, and transitioning to today's gospel reading, you know, I love the example that St. Peter gave and uh, have a love and devotion to St. Peter, you know, not only because he's the first Pope, but like you mentioned earlier, you know, he was the one that came out the water. He's the one that displayed the faith to actually come out the water, you know, but then he's criticized for sinking, losing faith. And in today's gospel reading, same thing. He he was asked something that Jesus Christ is asking you who's watching this. Who do you say that Jesus is? And our answer should be like St. Peter. You are the Christ, the son of God, right? But then St. Peter does something. Even though he has the faith, he still has the humility, the, the human condition, you know, to think as men and not as God, because then Jesus told him, called him Satan. That's pretty song. Uh, what say you, Father? Let, 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 look, at, let's go back to the beginning, okay? And you mentioned Matthew chapter 16, all right? And, of course, Matthew chapter 16, 13 through 24 very, very important, 13 through uh, 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 18, is the binding and loosing power of the church that he gave Peter. And I want to tell your your people, your viewers, your listeners, if you want to blow the minds of your Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic, all right, and you want to uh, easily memorize the three passages in the Bible the binding, loosing passages of the Bible that the authority of the church is built upon. It's very easy to remember. Matthew 16, 16, 16 being the middle middle verse. Mm -hmm. Matthew 18, 18, where he gives the same power to all his apostles. And then John 20, 20. Matthew 16, 16, 18, 18. John 20, 20. 16, 18, 20. Matthew, Matthew, John. Remember Everyone that. Everyone sees that. Everyone sees that on the screen. This, that's okay. popping up right here. <laughs> All right. So, so, uh, and and I'll tell you what. You know, your 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 Christian brothers and sisters who are not Catholic will be blown away by your understanding of the Bible. And of course, those are scripture passages they never want to touch because, right. of course, it is uh, the authority that Christ gives His Church on Earth. But I want to bring out something else very much apologetics that everybody misses, all right? And I'm going to use not just Mark's version, but Matthew's version. And really, if you want to study scripture properly, you need to cross-reference 
And I encourage everyone to take the Mark version and the Matthew version and try and join them together to get the whole story, the complete story. Now, what happens? Jesus says to his apostles, who do the people say that I am? In other words, who do the people individually say that I am? And of course, we hear, well, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're uh, John, the uh, uh, John the Baptist, some say you're one of the prophets. All right. Now, what can we say about those answers? What can we say about those answers? There's two things we can say about those answers when Jesus asks, who do the people say that I am? The two things we can say about those answers is they're all wrong. Oh, they're yeah. All wrong, and they're all different. And they're all different. So if you want to apply this to personal interpretation of Scripture, where people are trying to figure out who Jesus is, if you're going to personally interpret as the people do who Jesus is, you're all going to come up with different answers, and they're all going to be wrong. It's going only to be the, like a thousand different denominations, a thousand exactly different right. answers. And only the Catholic Church who was given the binding and loosing power, the authority of Christ on earth. Just historically speaking, he's just saying the facts. That's right. All right. Only the church, all right, can properly interpret scripture. And that's where we get to in uh, Mark uh, chapter 8 and, of course, Matthew uh, chapter 16. So apologetically, and everybody misses this, the beginning of these two very important passages Jesus lays out the fallacy of personal interpretation of Scripture. So what we have today in this important Sunday is we have James laying out the fallacy of sola, uh, sola fide, Absolutely. and we have Jesus laying out the fallacy of sola, sola scriptura. scriptura. Yeah, Right, personal right. interpretation. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling right. how sometimes these verses get glossed over. You know, right. oh, they never harp on these verses because it doesn't, it doesn't support their, their position, you know. And, you know, today uh, is the 24th Sunday in ordinary time. It's September 12th, but yesterday was September 11th. And I would like to reminisce on that day. It was 20 years ago today when our nation was shook. We were attacked. It's mind-blowing that I was only nine, 19 years old when that happened, you know. I was a different person. And, you know, when I was 19, I wasn't trying to emulate Jesus at that time. I wasn't trying to live up to his example. I was more concerned on trying to imitate Tony Montana or something. You know, I was in a whole different mind state and I was sleeping and somebody woke us up. They said, oh, man, the plane crashed into the Twin Towers, you know, and I have family in New York. Let me remind everyone, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So that's where I was when this happened. And I turned on the news and I saw there was, you know, one of the towers was on fire. I tried to call my family in New York because I had family that works right there in the financial district. So while I was watching it on live on TV, I seen another plane hit the out of the tower. And um, yeah, that's when I knew things, things was, was pretty real, you know. And I remember... I wasn't at my house, but I, I was living with my dad at the time, driving home in the morning, just hearing on the radio. That's all you heard about was what was happening. Then they attacked the Pentagon. And then a plane went down in, in Pennsylvania. You know, I haven't prayed to God in a long time at that point. And that day was like one of the first days. As soon as I walked into my dad's house, I collapsed to my knees and I started praying to God. I was crying, tears. And that was an encounter that I had and a memory I have of that day, you know. And may all those people who lost their lives that day, may they rest in peace. And, and, and it breaks my heart that on the 20th anniversary of this event, this current administration seemed to have strengthened those who harbored and abated the people responsible for the attack, you know. The Taliban now, it just seems like 20 years after this event, we lost the war. And it's just, it's just such shame, you know. But uh, Father Stephen and Barado, do you remember what happened when or where were you for September 11, 2001? 
Sure, I was in I was in the seminary up in uh, Cromwell, Connecticut, Holy Apostles, and uh, what most people don't remember, you don't mention it. It was probably the most uh, spectacular day of the year weather-wise in in the New York metropolitan area. And I remember waking up and saying, "Man, it's such a beautiful day." I mean, clear blue sky, crisp air. It was absolutely gorgeous, and so, of course, in the morning, we had morning prayer, and then we had mass, and then we had breakfast. And I came out of my first class, and that's when we heard uh, that. Uh, and, of course, at first they thought that just a, a, a regular uh, non-commercial jet hit the building, and we turned on the TV. And then just the you saw, the, the one building was burning, and the second building got hit, I mean, while we were watching it live. I mean, it was just, it was surreal. I mean, yeah, it, was, I it, was, it was like, it was like a video game. Right. Uh, and then of course, you know, with, what was it a half hour later where both buildings came down and uh, just absolutely shocking. But I, one thing I do remember, and I think that this is significant because of course, uh, Jim Havens, my co-host on the simple truth every Friday uh, says this all the time that in regards to, uh, 9-11 uh, and abortion, the abortion issue, that every day in the United States in regards to abortion is a 9-11. We have a 9-11 every single day. 3,000 babies at least are mass murdered every single day. But what really stands out in my mind, that was a Tuesday. 9-11 was a Tuesday. That Friday, we had a, a rector's conference, and the rector of the seminary uh, Father Doug Mosey, great pro-life priest. As we were walking into the rector's conference, he says, how many, how many babies uh, die from abortion every day? Back in those days, we were using the 4,000 number, right? And he says, okay, that's fine. He says, thank you. And I didn't know why he asked. But he went in and gave this beautiful, beautiful reflection about how here it was, this beautiful, beautiful day. Everybody was in work. Right, a place where they feel completely safe, feel complete comfort, right? Going about their business uh, like they did every single day, not having a worry in the world. And then all of a sudden, from outside of this comfort zone, they were attacked. And how they must have wondered what is going on, what is going on. And of course, uh, we know in this this womb, this comfort uh, 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 place of comfort, security. All right, three thousand uh, people died, and then he related it to abortion, and he he said, "Now here are babies every single day, the most secure place, safe place, mother's womb. All right, and the same thing is happening, and nobody bats an eye. That's what he said." He says, and yet everybody's outraged. The whole world is shook up. The whole world is amazed. They're shocked. And yet it happens every day, 3,000 times a day. And I will tell you, Charlie, it did affect the entire world. And just to shock your uh, viewers, uh, because you'd never guess how many babies die every day worldwide from abortion. The number now is 200,000 babies every single day die of abortion. There is no calamity. There is nothing on the face of the earth that compares to the daily mass murder of preborn children. So in the United States, every day is a 9-11. We should rightfully mourn what happened that day and never forget, never forget. But we should also understand that every day in regards to abortion in the United States, it's 9-11. And we do forget that all the time. Wow, that's such a profound analogy, you know, and it's, it's, it's true because then what it does is when the, the listener, they put themselves in the shoes of that person and, you know, you see, and then they put themselves in the shoes of the unborn, which is hopefully what I want to get across how, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be executed when you're at the most vulnerable and most defenseless point of your life, you know? And unexpected, you know, and, and it's just, it's such a profound analogy, you know, and um, one of the parts of the show is, 
the final part to end. And it's the hardest part of the show for me because I could keep going, you know, I could keep going. And last this last week's episode, I had um Joe, one half of the front lines with Joe and Joe, right? And he told me that you're on his show too, um, on the front line tele TV, front line television on uh on YouTube. Yep, sure. And I was, that's the show you was just mentioning with your co-host. I want everyone to tune into that. Also, everyone who goes to charliethecatholic.com, I would like to thank you. You know, I appreciate everyone who makes a purchase. As you see, I have some of the merchandise here behind us. I would like to showcase something. These book bags, it's time for school, back to school. These book bags were designed by my daughters. This one right here, designed by Michaela, Our Lady of Fatima, you know? And my younger one, she seems to have a devotion to St. Diffla. So she designed a St. Diffla book bag. You know, at charliethecatholic.com, the slogan is, wear your faith, share your faith. You know, and I'm proud of my daughters that that's exactly what they're doing. When they go to school, they're wearing their faith and they're sharing their faith, you know. So, yeah, thank you, everyone who goes in and, and, and makes a purchase. Remember, like, share, subscribe. Do what you can to try to get the words out. And Father Stephen and Barado, man, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. I knew it was going to be a great one, and I'm I'm just so happy to have you. Hopefully, I can have you again here in the future. Oh, anytime, Charles. I'd love to uh, spend time reading scripture, studying scripture, proclaiming scripture with you. Amen. Amen to that. Oh, and Father, before we go, can you please impart a blessing on my viewers and myself, please? Sure. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you all. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Go out today, my friends, and give them heaven. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Father. All right, guys. Thank you. I love you. God willing, I'll see you next week. Tune in to next week's guest. I have uh, Robert Sagenis. So hopefully you guys wow. love that. Wow. Yeah. God gave me his only begotten son. Hey, yo, no matter what I'm in, he's my Lord, my friend, my savior, who died for my sins. And truly we need him. They brutally beat him until he was bleeding. Until I would see him, then I would believe in. He was born of a virgin to the thorns he was wearing. And I swore I would serve him, but I slacked.